stolen. When it comes to insiders, they can well, different things can happen. There can be accidents. Maybe you email a file to, to someone who shouldn't have received it, uh, or maybe it's a lost device. And if customer data is not involved, it, it may not be reported at all. Okay. That's good. That's uh, it, it's good to know. Um, and now that we are all seeing the screen uh, and seeing the stats, um, we can move on um, to uh, actually uh, tell you a little bit on what the agenda it's going to be um, for today. The plan was uh, just a provocative thought, uh, thought at the beginning um, in terms of that research that was conducted um, just a while ago. The agenda for this webinar, it's going to take about 45 to one hour, 45 minutes to one hour is first to do the introductions, explain to you a little bit who we are and what we do and, 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 and why we have, we're so pleased to have Heidi with us today. Um, and then Heidi is going to talk to us a little bit about data, a data-centric approach and, and, and why is it required for security today. After that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, if you are, in fact, as an enterprise, controlling information disclosure and how do you uh, are able to control that information disclosure by applying a framework that Heidi is going to talk to you uh, beforehand on, on, their, on their part of the, of the presentation. Um, we will uh, be also able to give you a live demo of, of, of a solution that was developed by Watchful Software uh, called RightsWatch, so a live demo will be uh, will be uh, made available and please uh, do ask all the questions using the dialog box on the GoToWebinar tool that you have there. Um, uh, we have another person with us today which is Sergio and Sergio will be listening in to your questions and will be um, gathering those questions, those requests and at the end of this webinar, we will have a Q&A session in which we will be for sure answering all those questions. Uh, so please do ask those questions. This is for you to get the best understanding possible, either from you know whatever the insights that Heidi will bring us and 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 and, and the rest. Heidi um, is, is, is a seasoned uh, um, analyst from Forrester and, and, and she serves in the security and risk professionals. Um, um, Heidi is, is, is very active in the research that, he produce, that she produces together uh, with the other analysts in Forrester. Uh, for those in the realm, um, she's a known uh, uh, person to you and we are very, very pleased to have Heidi um, uh, present some of the insights that uh, Forrester was able to gather on their research. Um, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, for product management at Watchful Software. We are a software uh, vendor um, based out of New Jersey uh, and basically uh, we've been responsible for developing and marketing RightsWatch which is a data centric um, uh, solution, a data centric software solution uh, that addresses um, risk and privacy issues in terms of the sensitive data that you need to, you need to address. Some of the house rules, if I if I may, um, all of you are are, are mutedly uh, centrally muted, uh, so you don't need to mute unmute yourself. This is uh, done in order to have a, the best flow possible in terms of the in terms of the of the of the presentations. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, by all means, you will have or the, the the recording will be made available, if not today, tomorrow at uh, watchfulsoftware.com website, and you will be receiving a link to watch this webinar and the uh, slides uh, that are allowing it to, to, uh, to, to be uh, presented uh, also there um, on the website. As I've said, there's, there will be a, a, a Q&A uh, session at the end, but you're welcome to enter questions anytime. Please do using the, the chat feature in the, in the GoToWebinar control panel. So without further ado, let me uh, hand it over to uh, um, uh, Heidi. I'm going to give uh, control of um, my uh, uh, of the slides to Heidi. So I'm not, Heidi, you now are in control of the of the session. So fire at will, please. All right. Thank you, Rui. So let's see. Here we go. A data centric approach is required for security today. What does that even mean? this data-centric approach. Because if you think about it, everything that we do or try to do from a security perspective is, it's about data. It's about protecting the data. The reality is that I think how we've approached this 
um, in the past is, you know, we focused on devices. We focused on, on the network. And this image here, this graphic, is, is really a diagram that illustrates yesterday's approach to data security. And it might look familiar to, to a lot of you here. It illustrates a world where we have this, this self-contained corporate network outlined in this big blue box here. So we have our sensitive data and, and all these different categories of focus for security that's on the inside. And then outside of this corporate network, we have partners and customers, basically all of these, these untrusted parties. And, and this view of the world, it, it assumes that our employees and insiders are trusted. This notion of trust but verify is, a, I think, a very common saying that we hear over and over again in security. But unfortunately, I think today it's been reduced to a, a useless buzz phrase because we, we tend to trust our corporate users too much and we don't verify enough. This notion of, of trust but verify is it's outdated. You know, it may have worked back in the day when it was possible to treat your corporate network as this contained bubble and assume that if someone was able to authenticate in, you could then trust them and give them access. But today we live in this world where employees are they're getting their work done, not just in the office and on the corporate network, but also when they're in public places or traveling, commuting, as well as at home. And the data that's shown here is just overall results from a global survey that we did on information workers. Um, it's, uh, it's probably going to also vary quite a bit by country as well as type of organization, but you can get a pretty high level view of, of some of the trends and patterns that are happening today in terms of you know, how often information workers are, are working from various locations. And even within companies, these figures can vary a lot by job function as well. For example, your employees who work in sales may be more likely to work while traveling compared to employees who work in finance. And this is data from a, a Forrester survey of global information workers. So we've defined um, an information worker as someone who uses a computing device, whether that's a desktop, laptop, computer, tablet, or a smartphone for at least one hour per day for work purposes. So that covers a pretty broad range of, of workers that are out there. And a little over half of these information workers today are they're using multiple devices to do work. So not only are they working from different locations, but they're on different types of devices. And the thing is, no matter where these workers are or what devices they're using, they require access to the data and resources that they need in order to do their job. And so we're in this world today where you know, our data, your corporate data, is, is everywhere. It doesn't just stay within your corporate network. There's a lot of different places where your applications are hosted, where your data can be, whether that's you know, on-premise um, or maybe in a public or a private cloud. To, to various different SaaS applications and more. And then consumerization, things like shadow IT. These are, these are also a fact of life in many companies today. And IT simply doesn't necessarily have this visibility into where all of this data is located because there's a lot of different ways now that this data is accessed, whether that's on personal devices, uh, to devices that may be issued by the company. And then we also have all these different types of, of people, uh, these users populations, who would then require access to this data. And they can be your employees, your, your actual full-time or part-time employees, but they can also be contractors, partners, customers, uh, suppliers would also be here too. So think of all of this as as your extended enterprise, you know, there are no more walls and you know, everything, all these networks, I think you have to treat them today as, as untrusted. And ultimately, what you need to do is, is start to focus on you know, what really matters and that's, that's the data because that's the thing that's going everywhere. 
and as these walls have disappeared, we also we've got these different types um, of well, different uh, actors you could say within the threat landscape. And you'll likely encounter four main types of threats. Now, first off, we've got nation-state-sponsored attackers. For for these folks, it's it's really a day job. There are very resource-heavy operations here, where uh, generally they may be looking for for intellectual property, for example, or maybe they have a, a mission that's to gather other types of data to to conduct espionage. And these types of groups tend to to be in networks for a very long time. They try to maintain their access uh, to take as much data as they can and take the data that they need. There is a joke, uh, the saying, that if you suddenly notice your network operating better, faster, more efficiently, you might be compromised. But there's also some truth to that statement. You know, there have been cases where these types of attackers have reconfigured their victims' networks to make it easier and faster for them to steal and to exfiltrate that data. And then we also have hacktivists. For them, it's it's about sending a message. You know, DDoS is a very popular form of, of protest here. Um, you know, data theft may be a part of it, but they're they're trying to take this information and maybe dump it on the internet. And the main goal here, really, from a hacktivist point of view, is disruption, um, embarrassment, attention getting. They try to hit companies where it hurts, which is their profit or their reputation. And these hacktivist actions, they can be the result of, of social or economic or political events. So they're not necessarily protesting against something that your company did or did not do, although this might be the reason sometimes. Um, but basically, if your, your company is connected to the internet, that can make you a target. And then we also have cyber criminals, of course. You know, there's different types. With one type, it's, um, I think, fueled by, by organized crime. These are big groups who operate like a business. They may recruit at top universities, uh, give out jobs. Other types of uh, cyber criminals could be your, your everyday run-of-the-mill folks who don't require special skills. They can turn on the computer, go online, um, be able to click a few buttons, and be able to commit cyber crime. Because things like crime as a service is, is pretty popular today. Anyone can go and you know, pay for a DDoS attack or rent a botnet, pay for hacking services. And it's a pretty lucrative uh, market out here uh, because there, you've got all these underground markets where stolen data is sold and traded, uh, can be purchased. And so it's a pretty thriving underground economy that cybercrime can uh, feed into. And then we also have insiders. I think it's important to realize that your insiders are not just your employees, but they are contractors, they're you know, third-party partners, your suppliers, basically anyone who may have access to your systems and to your data as well. That, that essentially makes them an insider. And these insiders, they are, well, they're human. People make mistakes. It's not always a case of, of someone trying to do something malicious like steal data. It could just be the case of you know, they were trying to take some data home with them to get some more work done on the weekend. And then consumerization, when people start to use their own devices, services, and tools, uh, comes into the mix. This also helps to increase the room for error. So it's a pretty vast threat landscape that we're, we're trying to deal with here today. And then with insiders specifically, uh, I think they, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier before we began with that data slide that really showed, but you know, it's a pretty common source of, of breach of incidents today when we think about insiders, both you know, whether that's malicious intent or, or accidental actions. And these are folks who are um, well, causing their fair share <laughs> of incidents. This was a, a study that we did about a year ago uh, in 2014. And we tend to see similar results because we, we conduct the same study year over year. And oftentimes, it's, it is the internal insiders who come out on top. And it's almost counterintuitive because you know, we think about the news stories that we hear of, uh, what the media focuses on, and so much of that is about external attacks. You know, these are things that 
get attention, that get reported about. Um, I think often because if you think about it, if it's an external attack, chances are something was stolen, um, something of value like customer data, this would need to be reported. Um, in other cases with external attacks, it's, well, the company that was attacked uh, may not even realize it at first. And this is brought to light by a third party who's informing them. So once you get more people into the mix, you know, the news can spread more easily. I think often with internal incidents, many do not end up getting reported publicly, uh, especially if they involve um, you know, the accidental loss of, of intellectual property. If a company is not required to, to report something, often they don't. So we don't hear about it in the news. And then you know, another reason here you know, of how this, things are changing today is you know, employees, they also have these varying attitudes about data. This is from the same study from before um, where you know, we found that over half tell us that they're actually aware of or, or understand their company's data use and handling policies. And 56% and have told us that they actually follow these security policies. So it kind of makes you wonder where, you know, what are the other, say, 49% of folks, 44% uh, doing here? So company culture, employee attitudes have a pretty big impact on data security as well as the privacy as well. And then I think another challenge today is this concept of, of defense in depth that we tend to focus on. In concept, it's good. Um, it's notion where you're layering your security controls so that you can create friction for your attackers. Many people will imagine a castle, for example, with different barriers and obstacles that are in place that would prevent attackers from getting in. And conceptually, this makes a lot of sense because if attackers can breach one control or barrier, then there are others in place uh, in front of them that they then have to bypass. But unfortunately, I think for, for many organizations, when they follow this defense in depth strategy, it quickly turns into expense in depth. Consider expense in depth as a, a multi-layered approach to ensuring marginal returns on your security investment where you know, vendors will keep selling you one thing after another for the purpose of building this defense in depth. And then organizations use this strategy to just buy more and more. And in the process of doing this, I, don't, I think the, the strategy, the overarching, well, what's the plan? Why are we doing this? Gets a little bit lost. And we have this, this issue today with expense and depth because of a number of reasons. You know, one is this lack of overarching strategy. You know, companies, they're, they're chasing the latest and the greatest tools. They're being reactive in their decisions on what to purchase rather than uh, prioritizing their purchases based on mitigating risk, uh, based on advancing security and maturity, or, or purchasing based on a clearly outlined strategy. And then there's also this issue of insufficient due diligence, where you end up with uh, maybe overlapping capabilities within your tools. And this tends to happen when companies have a, a checklist approach to the types of technologies that they think they should have, rather than carefully evaluating and understanding what it is that they are able to get with uh, and, and do with a particular security tool. What Forrester has found is that in talking to our clients, is that sometimes people, they're, they're just not aware of the full functionality of some of the solutions that they buy. And as a result, they go out and they purchase another tool that has the same, if not similar, capability. And then another cause of expense and depth is, well, when we have difficulty integrating different solutions and end up with too many silos, we, we tend to have this expectation with defense in depth where, OK, we're going to, to buy all these different technologies and solutions and put them together in a way that, that makes sense. The reality is that most of the time, what we're, 
what we're doing is that we're not putting these pieces together correctly or appropriately because sometimes these these pieces just don't fit together or they don't integrate well or maybe they function more as a one-off standalone solution. Forrester has found that, that in talking to our customers that when they run into these types of issues, they're, they're not using the full functionality of the solutions that they deploy. And, and that's such a waste because it's like, like buying a car so you can listen to the radio while it sits in your garage. And so it, it's really time. For, for a data-centric strategy, uh, putting your controls closer to the data uh, because data will go everywhere. Uh, it's clear that you can't just focus on devices anymore. You can't just focus on your, your network. Um, you really have to focus on the data because that's ultimately what matters the most. And a data-centric strategy starts with a, a cohesive overarching strategy. When you don't have this strategy, you're essentially relying on hope. You hope that you've done enough without a clear idea of, of what that enough really is and hope that you won't get breached. Hope is not a strategy. So this is a three-part framework that Forrester has developed to, to help organizations think about data security and, and control and its guidance for a more holistic strategy. It's also one way to rally key executive stakeholders from, from across the organization and frame strategy in a way that, that is easy to understand because this, this doesn't get too technical. Phase one here is about defining your data. And what that means is that it includes data discovery as well as data classification. Discovery to identify where your data is located and then classification to label what is sensitive and what is not. The premise here is that if you don't know what you have, where it is, and what it is, you can't realistically expect to have in place the proper controls and, and policies to adequately protect it. And so this is all about being able to, to identify your high value data, like the stuff of importance and the things that you need to focus on. And so you can do this, you know, identify this high value data with the toxic data equation. It's called toxic because this is data that would do harm to your company if it was exposed. At a high level, this would include the three P's and IP, where the three P's stand for PCI, so that's personal cardholder information. PHI, personal healthcare information. And then PII, the personally identifiable information. And the three P's here, these are, this is mostly regulated data and data that you would have to protect anyway. But then there is IP, intellectual property. And IP is really the most overlooked data type out there because it's often difficult for organizations to identify. And this includes sensitive corporate information. I think that a good rule of thumb here is to ask a few questions. You know, one, you know, is this information that you uh, would be OK with if, a, if it fell into a competitor's hands, for example? Uh, I think that's a nice rule of thumb to, to use to evaluate whether something could fall under this category. And then phase two of the framework is dissect, dissecting your data. And this involves two parts as well. One is data intelligence uh, as well as data analytics. And what this dissect phase is about is, is using your security data to help protect your sensitive data. So looking at tools like, uh, and capabilities like network analysis and visibility, the, the ability to, to understand what's going on within your network, you know, mapping out how your data flows, and understanding uh, in real time what is going on, what the patterns tend to be, uh, what would be considered a normal pattern of business activity versus abnormal. And then we have, last but not least, you know, the third phase 
defending our data. So what we tend to find is that when we think about data security, oftentimes uh, people will want to jump straight to this last piece. What are the controls I can put in place? How can I protect this information? And they do this without thinking about the other two pieces, uh, the other two phases of dissect and define. And when that happens, it, it's easy to miss things or to only focus on one area and, and not realize you, you have something else that, that needs that attention as well. So when we follow the framework, it gives us that more holistic view um, and organizes things a little bit better uh, so that you, you can cover more ground. And so with this defend phase, we've got four key aspects to it. The first is access. So this is about access controls, making sure that the right people have access to the right data you know, at the right time that they need to use it for, for their jobs. And then inspect. This is about, well, we talked a bit about trust earlier and how there's no more of it. So we can't take for granted that you know, people who have these access controls are accessing data the way they should be. You know, we're going to, to verify that. We're going to inspect the data usage patterns um, and how people are using data. Um, so this is about inspecting those patterns so you can be able to identify when there's some kind of behavior that's abnormal or, or maybe suspicious. So if, if Bob typically logs in um, during business hours, does what he needs to do, and then goes home and, and stops, but then you notice that suddenly Bob is logging in at, say, 2 in the morning from a strange location, and he's starting to download things. Um, being able to inspect these patterns of data usage can, can alert you that maybe there's something wrong with Bob or his credentials. Maybe someone's uh, using it and pretending to be him. And then we also have dispose as a way of defending our data. So oftentimes when firms go through data discovery, they find out that, wow, there's a lot of data here that you know, we haven't touched in a long time. Nobody's using it. There's no business purpose for this type of data anymore. So if that's really the case, you can delete this, you know, get rid of it. Because at that point, if it's not being used and if it's potentially sensitive, um, it could be more of a liability than an asset. And data disposal is also, I think, taking into consideration the life cycle of your data. So maybe in that discovery phase, you identify data that, well, maybe it's, it's not really being used, but this is something you still have to keep. So then you can make decisions about archiving and retention as well. And then killing data, you know, this, this last piece here, is, is more about the things that you can do to, to devalue your data in the event that it is stolen or compromised. So make it useless to, to whoever has it. So this would include technologies like encryption, data masking, tokenization. So these are all killing data uh, technologies. And so that's the strategy. But then there's also the, the technology piece. And when we look at these, these key data security technologies that map to this framework, there are 20 that we've identified as main ones to consider. And while we can make that argument that you know, all security technologies are for data security, Forrester has identified these 20 into this particular category because these are technologies that can you know, do the following. Restrict and strictly enforce access control to data. Uh, monitor and identify the abnormal patterns of network or user behavior. Block the exfiltration of sensitive data or render that successful theft of the data harmless. And the image that you see here is the result of a research effort that we did to the plot, the trajectory of each of these technologies and where we see them going over the next few years in the market based on criteria such as, as business value add, uh, usage scenarios, as well as cost to implement. So they can either be determined to have minimal success 
moderate success or significant success. And this is a report that we wrote um, in 2014, but we're currently also doing an update uh, in, that's in process now. And what we're seeing is that, you know, it's interesting because for several of these technologies, uh, we anticipate that there's going to be some greater convergence in the future as these capabilities evolve. Uh, some of these standalone tools will likely become features of another security technology or you know, perhaps a more integrated type of security solution, which will then make it easier to implement and, and we're going to see these capabilities more widely adopted. So I've highlighted a couple here in, in the bullets as well as in the red boxes for you. So with discovery and classification, for example, we see some standalone tools in these areas today, but more and more we're also seeing discovery and classification as a, a part of a data loss prevention solutions, either as a feature or as a, a module. And then with sharing and collaboration tools, um, yes, there are standalone ones available, but you'll also see some of these capabilities emerge in other types of solutions, like managed file transfer or enterprise content management. And then when we take a look at data loss prevention tools, uh, this is an interesting space now because I think historically we've had these, these suites for DLP that I'm sure you've all seen. But more and more, we're, we're seeing DLP start to become a, a core feature that's included in other security solutions um, and security technologies like next-gen firewalls, for example, or email gateways. And then when it comes to rights management, we're seeing this pop up as a capability in a lot of the sharing and collaboration tools out there today, you know, making it easier to do. And the same applies to, to key management as well uh, when it comes to options to, to hold and uh, control your own encryption keys. We're seeing this pop up in some of the sharing and collaboration tools too. So definitely an evolving space um, to follow and, and just see how it develops. But exciting because a lot of these capabilities are, are core to data protection and we're seeing them um, become more common. And so when we build a strategy, you know, using this control framework and, and build our capabilities accordingly, I think we can expect to achieve several key benefits. The first is that you will get to know your data. It sounds like such a basic concept, but this is an area where I see a lot of firms run into issues. Most of them just simply, they don't know what data the organization has and what is sensitive and, and how it should be handled and who should have access. And perhaps more importantly, you know, why? Why is this data needed for business purposes? So when we know our data, we're better equipped to make decisions about its use, its life cycle, and the protections and controls that are required. And then another benefit is you know, aligning security with your business, business initiatives. This understanding the data and understanding how employees need to use it really helps to give us a, a big picture view of how this data contributes to the business and its growth. And it gives us better context for being able to speak about how security investments can directly influence the bottom line and support the business rather than having security be viewed as a, a compliance cost center. And then it also helps to prioritize our data controls and investment. So when we have this data-centric strategy, I think we can more clearly see where our gaps may be um, or areas where we are, are exposed to the most risk and then take action accordingly to mitigate or to reduce that risk and close the gaps. This helps us to prioritize our efforts, whether it has to do with, with updating policies or processes or investing in technology or, or people. And then another benefit is that it helps us to, to build this foundation for a better data security and privacy culture where, um, well, this data-centric strategy, it forces you to focus on the data 
and in getting to know that data, organizations will rely on employees across various business units, and it's not just an IT initiative. This really helps to, to put attention on data, as well as its importance, its level of sensitivity, and, and this need for proper handling. And then, you know, in turn, this would increase what you know, we would call data awareness across the company, which would then complement any type of security awareness and training that may be taking place. And then ultimately, you know, the mix of all of these forces together can help to, to elevate and transform data security and privacy into a competitive differentiator for the business. It helps to change the perception that security is a cost center, or something done for regulatory compliance or pure risk mitigation. As this internal company conversation and in perspective on data changes to, to be more mindful of security and privacy, I think we can see how it will influence how employees work with data as well as use it. And that's a, a huge thing today because uh, data is really, well, I'm sure you've heard the statement, data is like the new oil. It feels so much more uh, within the business. All right. So it looks like we've got a poll coming up for everyone. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, Idy, for that for that explanation. I mean, um, the, the plan here is for us all to to hear uh, the insights that you can bring to the table based on the the, the thorough research that uh, your team and in Forest in general uh, uh, does in this realm, and and to 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 spice things a little bit, you know, we've we've uh, decided to ask um, everyone this question. So um, there's a poll uh, being open right now and I ask for you to vote uh, on uh, what you anticipate as your biggest challenge for the data-centric approach um, and basically um, I'm gonna ask ID to give us her insight on this very same questions and, and in the interim if you're if you're kind enough to vote while uh, Heidi is giving her uh, explanation then at the end we can we can then share the results of that poll so Heidi if I were to ask you this what would be your choice and why I I think I'd go with classification as the biggest challenge, just based on what I've I've seen from and heard from from my clients. Because this is one of the things that well it's a core part of of the control framework. It's a foundation really for so much more. And while conceptually I think organizations get that, you know, how this can help and why it's important. I think where the challenge is, is the actual, the execution. <laughs> the how do I begin to do data classification if this is something that the organization has just never done before. You know, it involves change management, it involves um, a really a strategy as well to embark on this type of effort. And it's easy to overcomplicate it. Okay, so it's it's really a, a, fac a factor of um, knowing which type of data you have that IP on that IP piece on that equation, and and actually being able to tag it, classify it, and 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 and, and basically assess it for how sensitive that data file is. Is that is that a fair assessment of your of your answer? Yeah, because I think you know, from a technology perspective, the the tools are not that complicated for classification, but what it really rides on is, is the processes that you need to put in place, the policies, the you know, getting all the, the employees on board uh, with, with classification. And that takes a little bit of time to figure out. Okay, so um, um, we we just opened the pool uh, to everybody. Um, um, if possible, um, I would like to ask you to vote on what would be your answer. Um, we've heard about um, Heidi's perspective on data classification being the one that is um, that should drive or should pose the biggest challenge for, for a data centric uh, um, uh, approach to, to data security. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in understanding uh, what would be your thoughts. Um, I'm seeing uh, interesting results here. I'm going to leave it open for 
um, a couple more minutes. We have about 50% of the, those that are attending the webinar already voting. Um, we will leave it open for um, a little bit longer. If I need to take my pick as, as responsible for product management at um, Watchful Software, I would, I would also say data classification. I, I, don't, I really don't want to influence your decision, uh, but data classification because of what was just said by Heidi. I mean, you need to um, understand how sensitive, well, what data do you have, where that data is in terms of data discovery and classifying it according to an information security policy or governance model that you want to apply to that sensitive. Then, of course, applying you know some of the other aspects on the framework that was shown to us by, by Heidi in terms of the access control, the kill, and the disposal of that data, as we will talk a little bit. But if I had to pick, I'm not saying that the other uh, four options are not uh, justifiable options in terms of a choice but if I have to rank this I would say data classification would be it so by now we have as I've said 50% um, uh, of the people uh, uh, that uh, voted I'm going to share um, the results of the poll uh, uh, with, with everybody so basically we have 67% of those attending this webinar say that data classification is the biggest challenge. 17% talk about staffing constraints and 17% talk about addressing compliance requirements. Um, and no one has chosen a budget as uh, the biggest challenge nor uh, the prioritizing of our, uh, of our investments. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna uh, talk about this a little bit. So Heidi, from these uh, results, is there um, anything that strikes to mind in terms of the staffing constraints or the addressing compliance in, in, uh, requirements? Are those also known issues in terms of the challenges for a data-centric approach? Oh, most definitely. I mean, I think all of these are to varying degrees, and so much of it is dependent on, on just the company, you know, the organization and what they're dealing with. I guess I'm glad to hear that no one really pointed to budget <laughs> as, as the core issue. We have seen that um, really increase over the past few years, so that's been a, a good sign. But I think we all know that it's probably never enough. <laughs> it's just a matter of how, how we choose to spend it, where can we invest wisely. Um, I think the staffing continues to be a big challenge because you know, there's only so many hours in a day, there's a lot that needs to get done, and if we don't have that, you know, the appropriate resources on staff to, to help move the strategy forward, that's, that's a challenge. You know, things may go at a slower pace than we would like. Completely agree. So moving on uh, to with our, our webinar, uh, the plan now is for me to talk to you a little bit on um, what I've titled um, if, if, if we are actually controlling information disclosure or not. Again, um, this webinar is, uh, is promoted by Watchful Software. We are a software vendor. We, 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 we market and, and, and deliver um, a tool called RightsWatch. And I'm actually going to uh, uh, talk to you a little bit on how RightsWatch is able to uh, um, map, or how can you map RightsWatch to the framework that um, Heidi has, has told us. Um, but even before that, there is a couple of um, um, permits that, or permissions, or, or paradigms, if you will, that um, that are really striking as 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 those that um, uh, are, that we see in the market, uh, and, and 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 this is not you know me saying this is uh, information that was written by Forrester that basically I'm I'm trying to synthesize here in this slide. So the sheer amount of data to protect is overwhelming. So I mean it's um, it's not terabytes of data; it's more than that, and you need to be aware that whenever we speak about big data. And whenever you hear the word big data is really uh, what we're talking about. We're talking about huge amounts of data that are produced and consumed all over the world by companies, enterprises, and, and ultimately users that are the ones that produce that data and are the ones uh, also to consume that data. And 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 for, for those, that data is, you know, um, shared and used and ultimately has left the building as Forrester states in the, because, you know, you're using cloud-based 
uh, options or drives or or whatever or infrastructures in order to make it happen to share that information to store that information to allow that information to flow or even because you're you're, you're just embracing the the bring your own whatever you bring your own device bring your own uh, app bring your own whatever bring your own key um, into the equation whenever you uh, uh, embrace one of these things and I mean it's gonna uh, uh, it's gonna it's gonna make it so that the data is going to be shared and it's going to be taken to places where you need to actually control that data or even when you're um, uh, um, sharing information with third parties or consultancies or whomever that has access to your data as ID was saying you know it's not just about the uh, uh, worker of a company that you can call an insider it's actually everyone that has access to uh, your corporate data or data that is sensitive in nature or can be toxic as we as we've seen so I mean if you realize that data has really left the building and is everywhere then you need to understand that uh, you know perimeter based uh, uh, approaches for to defend that data they're not suffice anymore and you really need to uh, make a data centric approach um, the third thing here is that um, data really exists to be consumed uh, so basically there's no point in, in in having sensitive data if then you know there's no way for users or even applications or systems to reason over that data so I mean data needs to flow and we've seen how data flows and need data needs to be consumed so you need to embrace uh, what we call data centric security approach which means basically that you need to protect and control and assess and audit uh, whomever is assessing and handling and working and consuming that data wherever that data is in whatever system in whatever repository in whatever environment etc um, um, and then when you when ID was talking about the killing, uh, you know, the last the, the last part of the puzzle on the framework, um, it really means that you need to render that data useless, uh, you know, uh, when that security breach is going to occur. And what uh, we say is that, you know, it's not if, it's when that is going to occur because you can control everything you can you know protect your boundaries you can protect everything it's going to make what what will happen as we've seen or as we see every other week in the press is that that data is going to leak and you need to be uh, protected uh, and you need to make sure that you're protected uh, about that and one of the ways to be protected is to as ID explained you know just deploy encryption tokenization or whatever in order to render that data useless and unusable to whomever has access to it so that its value decreases over time what I'm going to show you now is is, is a way on how rights watch is really able to um, map or to be mapped into some of the areas of that framework Again, um, it is not um, Forrester's nor Watchful Software's uh, um, objective to say that you know uh, you need to follow this approach. Uh, what we say here in Watchful Software and with RightsWatch is that you're really able to tap into some of the um, um, some of the worries, some of the issues, some of the uh, pieces of the framework um, with with the RightsWatch. And the first one is the DEF. Uh, uh, that uh, embraces data discovery and data classification. It's, it means that you need to locate, index, and, and, and understand data to, to control it better. Um, RightsWatch does not provide any you know, data discovery tools per se, uh, but it does a very good job in terms of data classification. Nonetheless, when we're talking about data discovery, um, there's ways that you have that you should be able to run tools on your uh, legacy data for example Le data that exists and it's stored in a file share somewhere or in, in repositories uh, anywhere and run tools that will automatically um, uh, index and catalog that data uh, for you based on tags and according to an information security policy model uh, that you want to apply so it's not really about locating but it's really about indexing and cataloging once you've located where those where those data files are in terms of data classification um, there's a, a, a comprehensive studies in terms of how to do data classification 
what we feel data classification should be approached is in a two-fold uh, approach. One is um, it needs to be understood by users, by those users that will actually use those data files. And so it needs to be explicit for the user to understand that this file has been classified uh, with an appropriate information security classification level. And that you know, appropriate classification level derives from an information security policy scheme that your company has and you want to enforce and, and, and apply in real life. But it also means data classification that other systems, other tools in the enterprise, other infrastructures in the enterprise and other applications are able to better reason and apply policies on that data based on, let's say, for example, tags and metadata and X headers that you apply to those data files according, again, to the information security classification that you want to apply. So RightsWatch is really capable of doing both things by um, applying policies that are uh, triggered based on content, so specific keywords or uh, PCI, PHI, PII, or even sentences or project-related information or even intellectual property that is present in those data files. Or context, context meaning where am I saving this file or to whom am I sending this email to or uh, a combination of factors of such, a na of such nature. And also file attributes attributes, meaning, you know, file type, file size, file, uh, um, uh, um, ex ex uh, when should the file expire, etc., and or a combination of these things in order to apply data classification to uh, that sensitive information. And when we say data classification, we mean headers, footers, watermarks, tags, colors, borders, image, whatever would make sense to make it explicitly to any user that handles that file, that that is classified in nature and should be handled in care, while at the same time, adding uh, metadata to those files so that other systems, other applications in the enterprise are able to reason better over that data and to apply whatever policies they need to on those data files. When you go into the second D on the framework, you're talking about data intelligence and data analytics. And, in, and so you need to provide business uh, with insights about uh, that data and, and who is uh, handling that data and what are the threats uh, that you are uh, that you are faced with, and what are you know uh, mitigation risks or mitigating risks that you want to um, that you want to apply. And RightsWatch is really again without saying that it will reason or address any networking issues because that's not what what RightsWatch is all about. But in the context of an enterprise infrastructure, RightsWatch is really able to provide what we call intelligent time access and content expiration controls over data. That means that data that, from a data intelligence point of view, is sensitive in nature today, and in two weeks' time, it ceases to be sensitive because you know the project has uh, expired or uh, it's publicly available information uh, uh, back when that happens. So RightsWatch has, uh, has the ability to automatically declassify or automatically reclassify those uh, files without asking users to do so and understanding that the data files should be increased in terms of sensitivity or decreased in terms of um, data classification and the sensitivity of them. And also from an analytics standpoint, you know, when you're talking about a security incident and event management tool that is able to do correlations and it's able to digest, so to speak, logs and generate knowledge and 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 and, and, and information over those over that data, um, RightsWatch is able to log every action that the user uh, does on sensitive data and is also able to feed those logs into uh, you know an existing or a new to deploy uh, uh, sim or, or security incident and event management tool that is then able to produce reports alarms um, and correlations on those uh, uh, on those logs so that you get a better understanding on who is doing what when and how 
with sensitive data. So for example, if someone um, bulk declassifies um, a set of sensitive files you know, at one o'clock in the morning, um, you may want that to trigger an alarm and to understand what is going on with that person and why is that person doing that. And though with the logging capabilities and the forensic and the complete comprehensive audit trail from RightsWatch, you're able to extract that. When you go into the last uh, point of the framework, you're talking about access control policies, you're talking about inspecting and understanding what is going on, disposal capabilities, and even the killing of the data, making it rendering useless. And uh, even so, uh, RightsWatch is able to, from an access point of view, to apply the principle of list privilege by enforcing role-based access control over data. The point is, you know, what should I be doing? Or what should I, as a user, be allowed to do with this uh, data? Because it has previously discovered, classified, uh, and there's all uh, knowledge around it. So what is the access controls, uh, or what are the access controls that should be uh, put in place with this data. So with RightsWatch, you're able to apply um, role-based access control by which, depending on the role that you perform in that uh, project, in that company, in that uh, environment, um, internal or external users will have um, read, write, or different access controls over, over that very same data. For that, we use or we leverage or Microsoft's uh, rights management as the enterprise rights management tool in order to control and to ensure that. Um, from an inspection point of view, the logging, as I've said, of, of the comprehensive logging uh, on the user actions, and even from an admin perspective actions, will enable you to mitigate the malicious internal user. Again, RightsWatch is not addressing every single thing and every single threat from an, um, uh, or an every single inspect action that you should be doing according to the Forrester framework, but it's also helping you in that uh, area by, um, uh, by analyzing those actions from the malicious internal user and, and understanding how you should be mitigating those, uh, those threats. Um, from, a, from a disposal point of view, whenever you do a proper classification uh, uh, work to begin with, you'll have the ability to understand when and how to dispose of the, of the, of the data files whenever there's no need for you to hold on to those data files and, and to let go of that potential threat. So when you do that data classification with RightsWatch, of course, you'll be able to understand when you have to dispose of it. And then there's other tools, as always, in this framework that will do that disposal for you. From a killing perspective, so so if 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 a security breach occurs, how are you to uh, uh, to control and to make and to render better said that data useless whenever that data uh, is is left um, well has left the building and is being handled by people that should not have access to it uh, or are trying to access that data? So by leveraging encryption. Um, uh, um, and by uh, having the ability to do remote kill actions, so stop the access from being uh, allowed uh, wherever that data file is, RightsWatch enables you to have a complete control of um, who will be able to access that data even uh, when that data has been breached and that data has been uh, has been. Uh, is being is being in a possession of people that should not have access to it. Again, we're not talking about all types of data. We're talking really of unstructured data here, and that's what RightsWatch addresses. Again, the whole pur purpose of this exercise is to say RightsWatch will enable you to address some of the points on the framework that um, uh, Forrester has, has, has brought to the table. So in a nutshell, the last slide that I have to show you about RightsWatch, even before we go into you know a very quick live demo of the solution in itself is to tell you that if I want to explain RightsWatch in five um, concepts, I would say that RightsWatch enables you to identify by dynamically applying a policy engine that is based on content 
uh, aware uh, assessments and context aware assessments and even metadata analysis of the files what should be what is sensitive what uh, what is in fact your intellectual property that you should protect what holds uh, PCI data PII or PHI data as uh, and, and, and to portray the toxic uh, the toxic equation that we've seen before um, from a classification standpoint um, this is the thing or this is the step that governs access and usage to um, to the data that is intimately uh, um, aligned with a compliance policy and with an information security policy that you have in place and a governance model that you have in place in your house in your company and that is tied together with the ability to mark and tag those data files the ability to uh, explicitly label those files as uh, a sensitive in nature as holding you know uh, P uh, CI PII or, or PHI information or even intellectual property and label it as being internal use only being as uh, confidential in nature or secret in nature or whatever other classification scheme that you wish to apply to better serve your needs and address your, your, your requirements protection means that you're leveraging encryption you're leveraging enterprise rights management in order to ensure that wherever that data file is um, when, when someone double clicks the file to open it that someone will have usage and access control restrictions and enforced uh, to him or her basically can the person read and if the person can read the file can the person copy and paste print forward reply um, uh, and whatever uh, a comprehensive set of access and usage controls that you can enforce and make available to users depending on the role that they perform in the company so it's not a one-size-fits-all type of equation or type of uh, approach is meaning this user is performing a specific role inside this organization this project this context we call it scope and inside that scope this uh, user will have specific access controls enforced to um, to the file now last but definitely not least you will have the ability to say okay who has done what when and how with this data so if I go into from a logging perspective will I be able to be in good solid legal grounds for example if I need to be in a court of law and prove that who was the person that was responsible for that security breach or if I need to feed um, a security incident and event management tool as, as we've discussed before uh, with those actions and those loggings those loggings from the from the users in order to better understand who did what what, when and how with that data you can do so with RightsWatch. so without further ado the the, the, the point now and again I mean I, I, I ask you to be to ask questions and use the appropriate chat for that um, we will have a Q&A session at the end um, without further ado I want to really show you now uh, a live environment of, of RightsWatch. so I'm gonna um, minimize the um, minimize the slide deck and I'm going to show you a little bit about my own environment here and show you a little bit on what I do and what I use every day uh, to apply rights watch in real life so for example when I click a new email on my Outlook email application what you can see here is immediately you see some classification buttons being shown to the users and what you see here is information security policy scheme being applied from watchful software being applied to me the user as the director of product management now if I send this to my CEO for example just because I'm sending an email to a person at watchfulsoftware.com there's a rule that it gets triggered and the information is automatically classified as internal now the users most of them are good citizens but most of them if not all of them if not the majority of them are unaware of the information security policies that should be applied in this case to an email so any tool or any approach that you have needs to have the ability to help the user in making those decisions uh, because if you let to the user to make all the decisions and to go through a complex workflow of, 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 of actions in order for him to apply a classification and by this I mean you know combo boxes and, and complicated um, uh, workflows in which you will have to go on um, through um, 
pop-ups over pop-ups in order to make that choice, the user will not make any decision and it will default into the easiest possible uh, escape, uh, which would be do nothing. In this case, I've just said that this email is going to Charles Foley, which is the CEO of Watchful Software, and by default, the system defaults into an internal classification. Now, but if I say this is Watchful Software secret information and should not be disclosed, etc. As soon as I type here what is then, you know, something that will trigger a rule, you will see that the classification of the of the email in this case was automatically changed into a secret. Again, as a user, I did not have to do anything. As a user, I did not have to do uh, to make any decision. This was all policy based and and driven by the policies that were defined by the company. Now, what if I say, no, I want to send this email as public. So I want to reclassify this or declassify this file. And if I do so and say and click it into public, you can see that the send button is grayed out, it's disabled. I can no longer send this until I sign a disclaimer for non-repudiation purposes, for example, that also gets logged that yes, I acknowledge that I'm overriding a security policy that was defined by my sysadmin or by my CISO or someone according to the information security uh, governance model that I want to apply. So if I say no, it will revert back into secret. But if I say yes, it will allow me to send this email. Then you get all sorts of tags and watermarks and headers and footers and, 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 and complicated user scenarios in which if I attach a specific file into this email, and you know a specific classification is automatically chosen or if I block uh, emails from going out etc if I'm sending it to a specific recipient list or a specific users etc you get all that I'm just giving you uh, uh, the gists of the, the ability of rights watch to educate users into what does it mean to apply an information security policy and here we're talking about according to the framework data classification are we also doing data discovery yes of course because from the moment that I'm sending this email well, it's the moment zero in which I'm applying the data classification model into this. So I'm actually discovering the file um, because I'm actually classifying it from the moment that it is created. Now you can think of this uh, from, from, a, from this moment onwards, or you can think about legacy data in which you can apply um, tools that will automatically run through and, 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 and analyze the content, the context, and even file attributes of those files in order to apply an automatic classification model into it. If I go into, in the interest of time, if I go into, you know, a Word document, and if I just type in here, you know, some um, random text, in this case in Latin, this is not sensitive in nature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to file, I'm going to save this document, I'm going to save it into my desktop, and there you go, you have the same uh, classification here being applied into this document. Again, there's no complex workflow whatsoever that I need to follow. And if I need to make a decision, if I want to save this as internal, for example, I can even have tool tips underneath that will help me in making that decision. Now, what you can see here also is segregation of duties being applied, the privilege, the, 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 the principle of least privileges here, scopes. So for example, I perform different roles inside my company. I'm, I'm responsible for product management, but I'm also project manager of Project X um, here. And inside the context, inside the reality of Project X, I have information that can be unclassified, operations related, or management related. And depending on, let's say, content, context, or even a choice that I can make as a user, I can uh, classify the information in a different scopes with different classification levels per scopes. These are a choice and a setting that companies and enterprises can have to have scopes, to have less, more, different users will see different classification levels and different scopes in front of them according to their need to know, according to their role. And that's why we enforce role-based access control over the information. So, but let's let's hit the cancel button. Let's, let's go back and let's say, okay, somewhere around here, you have that very same uh, uh, string that will, 
you know, in this case, it's, simple, it's, a, it, it's an example, but it will identify an intellectual property piece. So if I'm saving this into my desktop again, from that moment on, you can see that the classification is different. Now it reads secret and the same principle applies. If I want to change it in somehow, you know, I have to sign a disclaimer. You can have disclaimers being asked to be signed by users for non-repudiation issues or not. The principle is you have the ability to log everything, all the actions from the users. And by applying an internal or confidential or secret or anything like that, you may also be applying the enterprise rights management into it. So for example, if I apply a secret classification into it, and I'm going to save this into my desktop, for example, as document one, what the system will do is classify the file with, you know, headers, footers, uh, watermarks, etc., and even dynamic classifying it, but it also applying the rights management uh, encryption and enterprise rights management encryption into it so that I can have a complete control over the permissions that I have over uh, this file. Going back to the uh, webinar, and I know that we uh, have, don't have much time, the plan now is for us to um, you know, uh, answer a couple of questions that you might have um, to us. So Sergio, if you're, if you're there, um, just give us some insight on, um, was there any questions being asked to us, to me or Heidi, um, so that we can take it now? Yeah, uh, Rui, thank you. Uh, there is a, a very specific roadmap question um, for you, Rui. Uh, Jim is asking if Whitewatch will be able in the future to uh, have the automatic classification capabil capability based on data from customer databases uh, rather than uh, regular expressions. From databases, I mean, the, the idea of RightsWatch uh, in a nutshell is to uh, apply classification and protection to unstructured data files. So whenever you're talking about database, you're talking about other types of technologies that will enable you to control access controls and protect the information whenever it resides inside the database. But when you're talking about a database, you're actually talking about the possibility of extracting, extracting information out of that database. And whenever that database is extracted, let's say in a CSV file format or in an Excel spreadsheet file format or even a notepad or an image file format, that becomes unstructured data. And from that moment on, this is not really a roadmap question. This is really something that RightsWatch is already able to address. Okay, thank you. Um, other question, um, my security policies are uh, already complex. How much extra work is involved in setting up configurations and policies for data classification? Um, Idi, would you like to take this one? Sure, let's see. Um, well, I think a good place to start at least to try to reduce the amount of extra work here is to really just check and see what already might be pre-configured um, in terms of policies to see if they would fit what your organization would need. Um, because if that's the case, then you can just start there, save some time and effort, and make any incremental changes as needed or you know customize to suit your exact needs. Uh, I feel like we, we touched upon this earlier, but classification is, and the best practices here could probably be a, a whole other discussion. So um, I think when we think about extra work here, it's it really comes down to simplifying wherever you can, because the challenge that I see companies go up against with classification is that they just they make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So simplify the number of levels you're using, um, and the the instructions that you you may be doing there. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Um, one more question. Um, do I need to boil the ocean and set up every single rule beforehand? Rui, this one. For you. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah, no, you don't, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should not do that. I mean, whenever, uh, from what we've seen uh, uh, in implementations of our technology, and for everything that we read, um, and 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 if you go and read the research from Forrester, you don't need to, uh, you know, boil the ocean and and think about everything before you uh, engage into a, a project that enables you to control and to classify and to understand which sensitive data do you have 
have, etc. So you have the framework from Forrester, and the framework gives you um, a good, a very good uh, uh, way for you to understand what you need to do first. Start from the beginning. Start from understanding where that data is. Start from applying classification and grow from there. Um, and even for in those cases in which you do not have an information classification scheme available to you, you know, just start with a binary choice. Just say, is this sensitive in nature or is this not sensitive in nature? And grow from there, if you will. From a discovery standpoint, there are as we've seen ways for you to address all that legacy data at once without even asking users to do anything, there are ways for you to um, you know, start from that moment onwards in terms of, of, of discovering which data do you have. So, so the answer, the short answer is no, you don't have to boil the ocean, the ocean and you should not do that at all. Okay, thank you, uh, Rui. Uh, just a couple of, of questions more. Um, the next one, um, I'm already doing device encryption. Uh, isn't this redundant, um, Heidi? Do you want to answer this? The already doing device encryption. Well, that's that's one way to protect the data. I don't. I would assume that the redundant piece is about the data centric protection, and I don't think it's redundant because, um, well, data doesn't. It's not necessarily going to stay on that particular device these days. So the controls really need to be able to follow the data wherever it goes. Okay, thank you, ID. Uh, Rui, uh, one last question uh, for you. Um, does it leverage AD and AD groups? Yeah, I mean, uh, from a from a from a from a enterprise perspective, you need to be able that to 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 leverage whatever it's already there. And you have AD for authentication purposes. You have, um, you know, other technologies like data discovery tools and, and and security incident event management tools and all that. And 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 the ability, or 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 better said, what you need to be aware of and what you need, what we feel you need to be conscious of, it needs to leverage existing technologies in your uh, organization or the ones that you're planning on deploying and that goes along with AD. Um, this is not in my uh, way of thinking it's not a subtracting game it's an adding of layers game so and Heidi showed us so you have device uh, encryption you have enterprise rights management you have uh, secure file sharing you have DLP and those all should play along in order to give you better protection it's not a question of removing stuff in order in order for this to happen so again the short answer yes you should leverage and it does leverage AD okay uh, thank you Rui um, other question uh, came up um, my firewall has DLP already um, how is this different from DLP uh, ID do you want to take this one ah okay well, generally, I think when we think about the DLP capabilities, the features that we find in firewalls today, they they tend to be, I would say, still pretty lightweight. You can get some basic policies in place to uh, detect data loss, but I think from, from my customers, I've seen some challenges with trying to use firewalls and the DLP function to detect the, the leakage of intellectual property because setting up the rules to detect that type of information is a bit more more difficult, especially if you, you don't have uh, classification in place. And at least with a firewall, you're only looking at um, only one channel of data loss and there are, are many different channels that you have to consider and that's a, a different kind of DLP discussion there. So you only have visibility into that one particular uh, channel that where the data is going through with the firewall and not other places. Okay, so I guess that's that's about it. That's about uh, as much time as we have uh, for this. Um, thanks for thank you all for joining. Um, um, you have ID's contact details on your screen right now. Uh, so uh, please do reach out to us. Um, this recording, this webinar, this recording will be made available along with the slides on watchfulsoftwares.com website, and uh, you will get a um, an, in, an email with uh, information about how to um, how to have access to it. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.